Uh, I'm Eric Admin, president of the Snooking Watershed Council. We're an all-volunteer organization helping protect, uh, helping people to protect local creeks and watersheds. And in this class, you're going to learn about why water monitoring is done, who does it, a bit about how it's done, and what you can do with that information. We'll also cover general concepts about water and watersheds, types of water pollution, how it's regulated, and what people can do about it. So first of all, uh, one of the questions we ask is, why do we think it's important to monitor water quality? And the basic questions that we're trying to ask are, or trying to answer, I should say, is, uh, is it good habitat for fish and wildlife? Is it safe for fishing, wading, or swimming? And is it getting better or worse, and why? We have five species of salmon in the Salish Sea region, also known as Puget Sound. This is a picture of sockeye salmon in British Columbia. We still have sockeye salmon locally, but the numbers are down. This is an article from January 1st in the Seattle Times talking about local sockeye returns, which are uh, at a really at a record low level right now, unfortunately. There's a number of factors at work. One of the biggest is urbanization. So as more pavement replaces forests and wetlands, stormwater running off affects local streams where salmon spawn. Overall loss of habitat, overfishing and hatcheries have also had effects on native salmon populations. Loss of food, uh, mainly salmon, as well as uh, pollution and other urban issues has resulted in declining orca populations locally as well. The exact number has varied to some births and deaths, but currently there's fewer than 75 of the southern resident orca population that remain. Local streams are important because they are where salmon spawn and the, the uh, salmon lay eggs in gravel beds called reds. And when the eggs hatch, the salmon fry live in the stream for a short period. So that's why the local streams are so important. My wife and I first became aware of the importance of local creeks when we came to live on a creek. We were amazed at all the wildlife that visited this wildlife corridor. We see herons, coyotes, raccoons, crayfish, brook lamb prey, and even the occasional large salmon. And people who lived on our property in the past used to see lots of salmon. We also learned living here that the little creek we live on called Little Swamp Creek was subject to a variety of threats. There was and is a lot of land development in the area. Forest is being cleared and land is being graded down to bare dirt. More rainwater is falling on hard surfaces and bringing pollutants into the creek. And this is what the creek looks like sometimes. In some cases, we've been able to trace the pollution back to an upstream construction site and contact authorities who are able to take action. Um, this picture here shows a concept known as turbidity, which is what we'll talk about a little bit more later. This is a graph from our Global Water Watch uh, system showing the relative turbidity when the picture was taken compared with normal. On this particular date, um, it was very high and you can see that normally it comes, it's close to zero. So this chart is from the monitoring data that we've been collecting locally on the creek that I live in on. The photo that you saw was also taken during a period of heavy rain. And you can see that not only was the turbidity high, but uh, this is a graph that shows E. coli bacteria. Uh, it's a bacteria that can make you sick. And in current Washington state standards, a number greater than 100 on that graph uh, is considered risky. And on, on the date that that picture was taken, we found 2,733 uh, what are called colony forming units, which is what they measure bacteria in. So very, very high level. So the question is for you, uh, what's your connection to your local streams and what makes you interested in water monitoring?
by learning about your stream's health, sharing that information with others, and letting people know when you find a problem, you can make a difference. Well, let's start and talk about who monitors water. There's different groups that monitor water. Federal, state, and local agencies monitor for regulatory purposes. Nonprofits like Smoking Watershed Council monitor for education, outreach, and also what we call first alert data, which is when we find something like the example of the high turbidity that we can share with agencies and let them know so they can take action when there's a problem. Our group is called Snoking Water Watchers. And we are a local all volunteer monitoring program operating in Snohomish and King counties. We collect regular data on streams, rivers, and lakes. We provide environmental education. We work to increase public awareness and we respond when we see a problem. Oops. Um, we're also part of a larger group called Global Water Watch. Global Water Watch is an international center that works on water resource problems in the US and in other countries. And probably our one of our biggest partner organizations right now is Global Water Watch Mexico. Um, but Global Water Watch has been uh, active throughout uh, South America as well as in some African countries as well. One of the types of monitoring that we do is for bacteria, specifically E. coli. So what the slide shows is these are what are called Petri dishes and they're uh, plastic dishes that we um, incubate our bacteria samples in. So we'll go out, collect a sample of water, mix it with something called media, put it in the Petri dish and incubate it for a given period. And what we're looking for is E. coli, which shows up as blue dots in, those, uh, in the slide. E. coli is an indicator of fecal contamination. I'm sorry, do you have a question? We're not seeing any dish. I'm sorry. You're not seeing the dish? No. Nope. Can you see what can you see? A group of people standing to take a picture. Oh, really? Oh, sorry, my slides are not keeping up. Uh, I think if you stop screen sharing for a second and then try again, it might refresh itself. I think that's what happened. I accidentally paused screen sharing. Zoom glitches. Okay, so can you see this picture? The Global Water Watch? Yes. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the picture that I had you, intended for you to look at. Um, these are the petri dishes which we incubate the bacteria in, and so essentially uh, we collect the, the bacteria samples, incubate them, and um, and then we count colonies and we can measure how much bacteria we're finding. E. coli is an indicator of fecal contamination and it can make people sick if they accidentally ingest it. So if people are, let's say they were collecting shellfish or they're playing in the water, swimming in the water, they could accidentally ingest some of this bacteria. So that's why we monitor for bacteria. We have a class on bacteriological monitoring. We usually do this kind of monitoring monthly, but um, you can identify what frequency would work best for you and your program goals. We also do something called water chemistry monitoring to look at physical and chemical indicators of water quality. These variables can indicate what's happening with the stream and what kind of condition it's in. And these variables usually relate to condition for wildlife. We've got a class on physical and chemical monitoring as well. And we usually do this type of monitoring monthly, but again, you can adjust the timing depending on what your program goals are if you're trying to capture an event like a high rain event. Uh, we also do a type of monitoring called stream biomonitoring, and we're looking for what are called benthic macroinvertebrates. Benthic means they live on the bottom of a stream, 
and macroinvertebrates are insects and other creatures that are small but visible to the eye. And these creatures are good indicators of water quality because they vary in pollution tolerance. So um, essentially what you do is you collect a, a certain number of these and then you try to uh, identify how many are sensitive, not so sensitive or um, tolerant of water quality problems. And that gives you a, an index you can use to evaluate water quality. Usually we do this type of monitoring about once a year in the summertime when we're when the streams aren't being used for uh, spawning for local salmon. Um, and we have this class called stream biomonitoring. Okay, we're going to talk about some basic concepts relating to water, watersheds, and water monitoring. So the first concept that's important to be familiar with is just the concept of a watershed. So a watershed is an area of land that drains to a common point, typically a stream or a lake or a larger water body. And they exist on different scales. So one of the major watersheds that we live in here in what's called the Salish Sea or Puget Sound area is the Salish Sea watershed. So essentially, if you uh, drew a line from the the high point of all the surrounding land, all that land that drains to a common point, which in our case is the Salish Sea, is part of the Salish Sea watershed. Then you can step it down a level and a major sub watershed or sub basin of the Salish Sea watershed is what's called the WRIA8, RIA8, um, Lake Sammamish Cedar, Lakes Washington Cedar Sammamish Watershed. And what that RIA acronym stands for is Water Resource Inventory Area. They've divided the state into a number of water resource inventory areas. And so um, in our area, seven, eight, and nine are the major water resource inventory areas. And those represent large watersheds that are sort of managed collectively for um, the purposes of salmon recovery. It's one of the main purposes. I live in the Swamp Creek watershed, which is a sub watershed or a sub basin of the Raya 8 watershed. So ultimately, uh, this sub basin flows into the Sammamish River um, and into Lake Washington as part of that watershed. So that's the concept of watersheds. Freshwater is another important concept, just about the scarcity of it. So freshwater, especially in lakes and rivers, is very scarce and very precious. And if you look at this illustration, only a tiny fraction of water on the earth is freshwater in lakes and rivers. Um, most of it is salt water. A little bit is other types of freshwater, um, including groundwater. And only about 0.2% is freshwater in lakes and rivers. And we're going to talk about some water pollution concepts. Water pollution is grouped into point source and non-point source, depending on where it originates. So uh, essentially, if the pollution comes from a particular point, like a drain pipe, then you'll call it point source because you can identify exactly where it's coming from. And if it just generally uh, comes, gets washed off the landscape, like stormwater, then you'll call it non-point source. So that's another key water and water pollution concept. Then looking at different types of water pollution, one of the major ones or a common one is called uh, is sediment, which causes turbidity. And this can be either point source or non-point source. Uh, this is an example of the creek that I live on at a point upstream where we identified that there was some uh, high turbidity we found at the stream at my location. And we ultimately walked upstream until we found a point at which the, uh, the water, the stream above was not turbid and the stream below was turbid. And we identified that runoff was coming off of a construction site. So we were able to get in touch with, in this case, it was coming off a site in the city of Bothell. We got a hold of the city of Bothell and the Department of Ecology. And they went to the construction site and had them uh, remedy their runoff issue. 
So if you find a water pollution issue, first of all, you want to identify what's happening and how long has it been happening? What exactly is it? Um, you're going to have to provide your information so whoever you report to can get back to you. And then you're going to want to notify typically a local jurisdiction and then also uh, anywhere in the state of Washington, it would be the Department of Ecology. And they have sort of different enforcement responsibilities, but essentially you're going to typically find that your local jurisdiction is more responsive and will re respond more quickly. But the Department of Ecology also wants to know about it and, and may come out and investigate. Another type of pollutant is what are called nutrients. And those are primarily phosphates and nitrates. These are nutrients for plants and they typically come from fertilizer, but they can also come from some other sources like phosphates used to be present in a lot of soaps. And so that's why they've uh, limited the amount of phosphates that are in soaps because the, the adverse effects that was happening when it got in the water. What happens is it runs off of lawns and other surfaces into streams and lakes and the excess nutrients can cause what are called algae blooms. And then algae blooms can either be, um, they can be toxic uh, and they can also change the oxy oxygen conditions in the water. Another concept in terms of pollution is stormwater and the toxic substances that are found in stormwater. So a lot of people are not aware that the drains that they find in local area along the edges of streets, all those storm drains drain to streams ultimately, and typically without any sort of filtration. There's a lot of different toxic substances that are present in stormwater, including tire particles, chemicals, and oils. And I don't know if any of you have seen this recently, but there was a recent article, research article that came out and essentially they pinpointed that a particular chemical that is a, a product of something that's applied to tires, vehicle tires, uh, has been implicated in something called urban runoff mortality uh, syndrome in salmon. And what happens in this syndrome is the, the salmon return to the stream and then they start exhibiting really bizarre behavior, kind of swimming on their side, um, gaping, um, and ultimately they die before they have a chance to uh, lay their eggs. So they've kind of identified what it is now that's causing it or one of the key indicators. Um, they haven't exactly figured out still what they're gonna do to try to limit that, but that's an issue with stormwater. Um, we've already mentioned another type of uh, Water pollution is bacteria and other pathogens. And these are present in human and animal waste. Um, human sources can include failing septic systems, uh, dog poop that doesn't get picked up, and also urban camping, like homeless camps in green belts along streams. And we're gonna switch and talk a little bit about water quality regulation Water quality is regulated by a number of laws. At the federal level, regulation of water pollution starts with what's called the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act was established in 1972 in response to major water pollution issues in rivers and lakes, which was relatively unregulated at the time. This is a famous ish image of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. And it was after some outcry, after issues like this, that uh, the federal Clean Water Act was established in 1972. At a state level, the Washington Administrative Code uh, is one of the major bodies of law in Washington state, and it regulates freshwater designated uses and criteria. And there's a number of variables that are monitored, including, or regulated, I should say, including temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, pH, and fecal coliform. There's also some other important regulations at the local level as well as at the state level. So there's what are called comprehensive plans is something that are passed by cities and counties. And that essentially defines how big is the buffer on any given stream or lake or body of water 
and also what is the surrounding land use so is it commercial is it residential is it a park um, what's going to be the, the land use so that has a huge effect on water quality there's also specific regulations land use codes at the county and city level that govern what you can do in terms of clearing and grading um, and land development and that has a huge effect there's a statewide level and then implemented locally are things called shoreline master programs so anything that's defined as a water of the state which is essentially bigger much very large creeks um, pretty much any rivers and lakes are defined as waters of the state and so there's special set of regulations that apply to those and then this is another uh, kind of big concept uh, the NPDES permit national pollutant discharge elimination system is a federal regulatory system implemented by the environmental protection agency but then handed down to the states so for instance in our case the department of ecology implements this and the way that this regulatory framework works is that each county and city has to periodically update what their plan is for managing stormwater in their jurisdiction and they submit that plan to the department of ecology and if it's approved then that essentially establishes what are the stormwater specific regulations that are going to have to be followed in that city or county another uh, important set of regulations are what are called tree ordinances and those define how many trees that you you need to retain within your overall jurisdiction what sort of a tree canopy do you want to retain and that has a huge effect as well on water quality because essentially once a watershed gets deforested beyond a certain point you can't have a, a healthy stream in that watershed so what are some things that people can do themselves to mitigate water pollution here's a number of them um, building rain gardens, uh, restoring uh, stream buffers, picking up pet waste, fixing oil leaks, avoiding fertilizers and chemicals, um, use of green roofs and porous pavement are all things that people can do that will help reduce uh, water pollution on their own. Okay, water monitoring. So let's talk about the steps in water monitoring. In general, the steps are making a plan, picking a site, uh, collecting some data and recording it on forms uh, or however you choose to record it, and then using that data to help accomplish your goals. So we'll talk about uh, each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So, um, I'll share with you some water monitoring manuals from Global Water Watch that cover all these topics. And uh, there is one that's about introduction of water monitoring. Um, basically the process is you're gonna define your goals. In other words, what are we trying to accomplish with this water monitoring? Are we trying to just learn what's happening? Are we trying to educate other people? Are we trying to identify conditions that we do or don't wanna see? Um, are we trying to help uh, educate a group of students? What are we trying to do? So you define your goals. You're gonna gather information about the overall watershed. You wanna get familiar with where the stream goes. So if it's a stream that you're monitoring, you wanna do what's called a stream walk, which essentially means you wanna find out where that stream flows through the watershed and identify things that might affect that stream. So you're going to identify what are some important areas in that watershed. So maybe there's an area that is being developed commercially, or maybe there's an area where there is a big stormwater input, or maybe it's an intersection with another water body. So identify what are some of the key things that are affecting the stream. Then you want to select a specific site or sites on that water body or in that watershed that you want to monitor start collecting your data and then put your data to use. So those are the basic steps in water monitoring. 
We talk about picking a water monitoring site with class. And this acronym stands for convenient. So when it's not difficult or dangerous and like uh, maybe close to you would make it convenient. Uh, legal, you have to make sure that you actually have permission to do the monitoring on that site. Accessible means you can actually get down to the water to uh, do the water monitoring. Um, you want to choose a site that's safe. Um, there's a number of factors to consider. We've actually had some sites that we had to abandon because they were unsafe because they became um, urban camping sites and we didn't want our monitors to encounter almost people when they were out there. But there's other issues um, like traffic or um, visibility. So you want to choose a site that's safe and then find a site which is strategic. In other words, it fits into what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so you learn about your watershed, you get trained out of water monitor, then you're going to start collecting data. And um, there's particular forms and process with the organization we're working with Global Water Watch. So first thing is each site gets uh, what we call a monitoring site form. So essentially, we're just collecting some information about who's doing the monitor monitoring, what's their contact information? Are they part of a group? or are they just monitoring on their own? What's the water body and watershed? Um, and then we'll get some descri detailed description information about uh, essentially how do you get to this site so that if it's not you, maybe it's some person in the future, how do they locate the site, latitude and longitude? And we'll use this to set up a, a record in the Global Water Watch database so that every time you log in, you're entering data related to that particular site. These are examples of the different forms that we'll use, and we recommend that you keep a copy of them. Uh, this is an example of the monitoring data form for physical and chemical monitoring. So this lists out, uh, if you look, I'm not sure if you guys can all see that, but basically it lists out the group, who the monitors are, um, what the site is, and then it lists the different variables that we're monitoring and collecting data on. So this is essentially the, the Global Water Watch form that we use. As I mentioned, the uh, data gets entered into the Global Water Watch online database. And uh, there's a number of things that get collected here. So we're gonna collect data about people uh, who are monitoring about locations. We're gonna collect information about the water itself. Um, and then for display purposes, uh, we've got various graphs, maps, and tables that are available. So to access that, uh, in our program, you'd start with our Snoking Watershed Council website. And we have a page uh, about the Water Watch program um, with a link on our website. And then once you log in, there's a, just a welcome screen, uh, or I should say there's a login screen. Um, and then there's a, a welcome screen. And this is just what it looks like. And then you would select, okay, um, am I gonna enter chemistry data? Am I gonna enter bacteria data? Am I gonna enter biomonitoring data? What am I gonna do? Then you just go through and there's an online data entry form that uh, corresponds with the data collection sheet. And then you enter the data and you're pretty much, um, your information goes into the system and it's available to, to view. After a, it goes actually through a quality assurance process first and then you're able to view it. Okay, so now we've learned how to monitor, we've gone out, we've collected our data, we've entered it, now what are we gonna do with it? So there's a number of things you can do with it. One is interpreting it and presenting it to other people. So here's an example of a group that tracked uh, alkalinity numbers, which is one of the chemical variables that we track monthly or at whatever frequency you monitor. And what they identified was they had all these different sites which are numbered along that river. 
Um, one of the particular sites, they found that they had a very high level of alkalinity um, out of line with all the others. So what they did is they identified that it was coming from actually a point source. It was coming from an industrial plant. And so they were able to get some action taken to reduce that uh, pollution coming from the industrial plant. So that's one example of how you could use data. Uh, another example would be just showing the data that you're collecting. So this is an example of E. coli data on Little Swamp Creek at a particular one of our monitors properties. And we find that every summer, essentially, we get very high bacteria numbers. So there's something odd going on because those are very, very high numbers. Um, so in this case, we were able to show this information to the city of Bothell and get them to help us investigate what was the possible water quality issue going on that was causing these periodic high bacteria levels. You can also make uh, share the information with other people who might happen to run into you, um, or uh, we, so you could either have pieces of information you pass out, or uh, you could post. We can post it on the website. So these are what we call stream report cards that we're developing for some of our different monitoring sites. Uh, another way that you can share the information is you can present it to somebody. So this is an example of a group that we work with called Student Saving Salmon. They go out and monitor. They're, they're essentially a club associated with Edmonds Woodway High School, and they have a club advisor. They go out and monitor monthly on a number of streams in Edmonds, and then annually they deliver a water quality report about Edmonds streams to the city council. And so this is an example of a, a very impactful way to use your monitoring data, um, especially because uh, youth in particular, but anybody who actually comes in person and presents their results to elected officials it can have a big impact. So that's another way you can use your data. This is another group that we worked with up in Snohomish County near, um, actually in the city of Snohomish. There was a group, another club associated with a high school at Snohomish High School, the Snohomish Junior Sportsman, who talked about bacteria in Blackman's Lake. And so they they monitored for about a year and then they uh, put together this public meeting and they talked about not just bacteria, but other water quality issues as well. But that was one of the primary ones. And so at this public meeting, they were able to get a lot of attention to the water quality issues in Blackman's Lake. So that's another example of how you can use your information. Okay, next steps. So um, if you wanna start monitoring, uh, you would identify, is there a stream or a watershed that you wanna monitor and learn more about it? And there's a number of different ways you can do that. You wanna look for things that might be affecting the water body that you're monitoring. So are there fish barriers? Does it need more shade? Are there construction projects? Um, are they changing the buffers? Think about what is it you're trying to accomplish by water monitoring? Are you just helping another group collect data? Or is there something you want to illustrate or something you want to learn? Think about your goals, make a plan. And then you can start monitoring regularly either with us or with others. And you can take that information you find, help educate others, and uh, try to make your water body better. <laughs>